What a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. Don't you want to want to tear up a little bit or something? That was one of the finest introductions I've lovely. ever been given. Thank Very you. Very nice. Thank you. We had no idea. We were all sitting back there just talking about The Bachelorette. <laughs> I had no idea that you'd... That's lovely. So, um, obviously you're well loved. You should move here to Seattle, you know? Yeah. No. Place is packed. Yeah, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep visiting regularly, though. Yeah. Yes. And you love Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. Yes, good. Um, I wanted to ask, she mentioned difficult women, are, are the, is any of your work being turned into film or um, what, what do you have going on? Um, uh, An Untamed State is a movie. Um, uh, we just finished the screenplay and we're hopefully going to move forward. Uh, it's at Fox Searchlight. And this is Difficult Women? or No, An Untamed State. Oh, oh okay, novel. great. Got it. And uh, Bad Feminist has been optioned by Amazon. And I'm writing a TV show for them. Who would be your bad feminist? Hmm. And no. uh, so none, none of the stories in Difficult Women have been optioned yet, but I'm sure at some point that yeah. will happen. Yeah, I am sure too. Yeah. These are just the kind of stories that need to be widespread everywhere and, you know, put women in behind the camera and in front I of the camera. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. Um, so, Hunger is debuting on the New York Times bestseller list at number nine, and Not That Bad will be at number 15, so you have two books on the New York Times bestseller list at once. I do. No big thing. No big thing. And I have to say, when we, she was describing everything that you do, and you still have time to tweet and write and do, how... Are you a very organized person, or no? No, not at all. I am um, wildly disorganized and terrible with deadlines. Okay. It's, I'm not proud of it, but it, it's just the truth. Uh, and fortunately, I'm at a place in my career where I'm tolerated, even though <laughs> I'm terrible That's where with you want to get in life. It's like, yeah. you know what? I'm tolerated. I, I think if I hit within a week or two of a deadline, then it's basically on time. So uh, I just I just am a workaholic and I don't sleep much. So and I don't have kids, which helps. Yeah, that would help a lot. It actually. does. I love kids, but uh, I also know that it is very time consuming to have a family and also to be a writer. So. So is there? I mean, this is just for me because I'm a writer nerd. I love to hear how writers write and where they find their inspiration and where they find the time to do it because sometimes it's the last thing I want to do, you know. I'm been, so do you get up and write and do you have any kind of routine or is it just nope. when, when, the, when, the, when you feel like it? I wish it was when I feel like it. Uh, <laughs> it's just, I, it's triage. Okay. So I look at all the work I have to do and I chip away at it slowly but surely. Right. Um, I prefer to write at night and after it's dark, which makes writing in the summer a pain in the ass. Yeah, never go to Alaska. Yeah. Just don't. You'll never when get anything When I was in done. Sweden, it would get dark at three in the morning and I was just like, uh, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, it was great. It was actually really interesting, but it was also really challenging because I like that darkness outside. Um, so I don't have a routine. I just write whenever I can for as long as I can. And there's also a lot to be said for being pissed off, you know, when something really... Oh, well, yeah, when something happens in the news or in the world that I feel the need to respond to, oftentimes in the moment I will have an opinion and I'll start to put something down. But increasingly I'm taking some time to put some distance between the heat of the moment and what I have to say because the internet is littered with really fast responses. And I understand why. When you're up and coming as a writer, you have to feed the beast and you have to work really fast. And that's fine. And oftentimes people can do really interesting work, but I find that I work better when I have a day or a week or a month to really sit with something mm -hmm. and see how I feel and process it. And so I'm trying to do, I mean, I'm still passionate, but I try to temper um, that heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. I think that's 
really wise. You want to let the smoke clear a little bit. But. I do, and I just I think that we need to give ourselves more time to make sense of things. Oftentimes, when something happens, editors are in my inbox like five minutes later. Like, do you want to respond to the Beyonce album? And I'm like, it's like 40 minutes long. I'm <laughs> gonna have to hear the whole thing first. <laughs> And I, I think we have to resist that impulse. Mm -hmm. I, I think people can and should wait sometimes because when you respond too quickly, a lot of the, it can be really half-assed mm -hmm. and short-sighted. And sometimes the story isn't even finished before people are writing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to take more time and I can take more time, which is great. So when the editors are emailing you about something, what are they looking for, do you think? Oh, they're just, they're, they want to be first. Um, but they, they want, want you. They do want me, why, yes. why is that, do you think? Uh, because I'm very good at what I do. Okay. okay, I love you. All right, so let's talk about this new book, Not That Bad. Yes. Um, which is a collection of essays about rape culture. Um, your timing is amazing and impeccable. Um, I try. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, how the book came together and something you talked about, which is, this is kind of a two-parter, but I love the basics, the logistics of how it came together um, and the submissions and all that stuff, but also what it means to live in a world where rape culture exists. That's something that you touched on in the, in the book. So I wanted to just... Um, where did the, I, I think we all, we all know where the idea came from, but can you talk about how you pulled it together? Yeah, I sold Not That Bad after Bad Feminist came out, and I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, and I had already sold Hunger, but I thought that it would be interesting to open up a conversation and, and include voices other than myself, because plenty of people have things to say about rape culture. So my initial conception of the anthology was to be cultural criticism with essays about the phrase rape culture and what does it mean to date and have relationships in a world where this exists and um, what do we do with all of these statistics that are regurgitated time and again um, that, but also that, and it's important, but th those statistics tend to obscure the realities of what it means to have endured sexual violence or sexual harassment. And so I was really looking for writing that would engage with that. Uh, and I decided to open up submissions. I ended up receiving 330. And um, when I started reading the submissions, I realized that my best laid plans were not going to come to fruition because nearly every submission was testimony, mm -hmm. was someone who had a story and they needed to share it. And that's actually why I had to reject most of those submissions because they weren't essays. They were some, they were women. They were just. Just this terrible thing happened to me and here's what happened. Mm -hmm. it, it, there was no craft to it. Mm -hmm. But it was heartbreaking to just see how much pain there is and how much pain there is specifically around sexual violence and how far reaching the repercussions are for pretty much everyone who has been assaulted or mm -hmm. harassed. And so that's when I realized, okay, this anthology needs to be something else. And so I solicited about half of the work, and I took half of the work from the submission queue, and I'm really pleased with how it came together. I was, what struck me is the breadth of um, the types of people. You have men in there, you have uh, transsexuals. Transgender. Transgender, I'm sorry. You have, um, uh, young women, older women. When I wrote about, I, I wrote a column about the, when Me Too uh, first started, and it was my experience and then a commentary on just how the whole thing was unfolding and how everyone thought it would only last one news cycle, what have you. Um, two things. One, I heard from women in their 80s and 90s. I was struck by older women, much older women, telling me the stories. And in some cases, I was the only person they had ever told, which I'm, I'm wondering if, if some of your essays were maybe the first time those stories were put to paper. But the other part was, um, I was everybody talks about the trauma and the post-traumatic and how it, um, you never 
you, it stays with you forever and how these experiences, I'm still remembering slights and weird shit that's happened to me. And even the weekend after Me Too came along, I was at a wedding and one of my friends, my best friend's brothers was all, had a few drinks in him and said, you know, I could have had you back in the day and I could have had you back then. Like I was something to be consumed, you know? So I'm struck by just what these stories how you went through them, how you sorted through them, what you were trying to represent. And I also think there were these threads that went through them in that everyone was traumatized and what they did with it. Yeah, I was just looking for interesting, well-written stories. And I was looking for people to say interesting and original things about the experience of assault or harassment. And it was important for me to do that with a diverse group of writers, and I mean that not just demographically, but also aesthetically, so that there would be a range of narrative styles and approaches throughout the essay collection. And it was just really interesting to see that when I started narrowing down what I thought I would include, there were some really common themes that were coming up again, and I thought that really contributed to the overall impact mm -hmm. of the book, um, that nearly everyone diminished their own experience in some way, and thought, okay, well, what I went through sucked, but it wasn't that bad, and I'm really interested in that diminishment, and why we do it, and how damaging it is to do that. Um, and I was also interested in the after effects, not just what happens in the moment, even though there was a lot of writing about that, but how it undermines confidence and how it tempers joy and... And it impacts intimacy. Absolutely, and relationships, mm -hmm. both friendly, romantic, familial, mm -hmm. it just... It's a cancer in many ways that infects the aspect, every aspect of one's life. And it was interesting to see just how powerful the collection was becoming as I started to put all of these essays together. You say good stuff, sometimes I'm gonna write it down. Oh, feel free. <laughs> so um, I wanted to talk about a few of them. Um, Aubrey Hirsch, I really loved Fragments because I especially loved the advice that she had for her sons or the things that she was going to teach her sons to say. Like, is this okay? And you know, there's a whole other side to that. And then she, she had a bunch of things that she, uh, I don't know if people have read the book, but in this one essay, she describes taking a birth control pill at, in a cafeteria with a friend, a male friend sitting there, and he said, why are you taking that here, out in the open, where people can see you, they're gonna think that you're easy because you're taking a birth control pill. And she was, you know, she took it. What do you, but every little thing can be seen as, um, can be interpreted in a twisted way. Yeah, Aubrey's essay is the first essay in the collection, and it was, to my mind, the, the best essay to open the collection with, because what she really showed was a lot of the s seemingly smaller things that happen, the sexual harassment, the comments when you're walking down the street, the esteemed writer that visits your campus and hits on you, and how they accumulate, and how they really start to reshape how you see yourself, and how you see men, and how you see intimacy. And so I thought it was a really good essay to set the tone. Mm -hmm. And it did set the tone, and it's actually one of the most frequently mentioned essays, I, for many reasons, partly because a lot of the reviewers only read the first essay. Not me, not me. I love it, I just loved it. But also it's a very good essay. <laughs> yeah. And then Cherise Tracy, another essay. When she was 13, her father sexually assaulted her. She told her mother and her father, and you know, shared her with her parents. They went to therapy, mm -hmm. and the therapist told them to, to go to Magic Mountain, to go on an outing together to, to fix things. Yeah, people have the most asinine advice and sort of 
punishments for people who commit sexual assault and rape. And to tell a young girl who has just been raped by her father that um, she, they should go to Magic Mountain as if Disney World will fix everything just shows that people don't even understand. Or they understand and they don't care. And they think, oh, this is fine. Um, I went to boarding school and recently, for the past two years, um, we've been dealing with a lot of scandal uh, because one of the teachers that was there during my time actually had an affair with a student and then there was a young man who sexually assaulted a girl by grabbing her ass and cornering her and doing all sorts of things. And Reverend Thompson, who has been the school reverend for since I was there and before, and he is also an alumnus, uh, he told the young man that he should bake the girl monkey bread and give it to her. And so he's on leave, <laughs> which thankfully. Um, Unfortunately, there's some other stuff going on there because Reverend Thompson is black and uh, Exeter is racist, but um, he advised that this young man bake monkey bread as if that would make everything better because he didn't want to damage the young man's future, but he wanted the young man to put some effort into reconciling. And it, it's just, when you think about it, it becomes more and more mm -hmm. offensive. And it's the same thing that Charisse, uh, talks about in her essay uh, that no, never does it occur to people to suggest going to the authorities and having actual consequences for mm -hmm. these people who commit these crimes. And it's, it's, I think that's in many ways even more horrifying than the prevalence of sexual assault. It's the way we respond to it as a culture. Mm -hmm. One thing that I liked about the book, you know, there's this discussion about um, did it really happen? You know, a lot of what came out of me too was people felt for the first time that they were being listened to, that people actually believed these stories. And I look at, at Not That Bad as something you can kind of hit people over the head with. You know, a collection that's going to be kind of a brick, that these things actually happen. They're well written by intelligent women. The stories are complete, and men, and the stories are varied in, in the things that happen. Do you understand? It just feels like it's such a, a it's evidence. It's, it's literary evidence. It is, but you know, the thing is, evidence has been around for millennia, yes. and people have ignored it. I do hope that people will read this book and hopefully because it's collected together, it will right. have, and it's so many different writers, it's 29 writers, hopefully that will have an increased impact. I was at an event the other day in New York and a young man came up to me during the signing line and he said, I've hurt women in the past and I just want you to know that this book has changed me and is making me go get help because I don't want to hurt women anymore. And I was really moved and also like kind of scared <laughs> because <laughs> he was one of the most handsome men I've ever seen in my life. He was flawless. And I was just like, wow, this young man already knows he's done damage. I mean, he couldn't be older than 25. Um, and I just thought, wow, what happens in a world where a 25-year-old man knows he's already done damage to women? And I don't know what kind of damage, he didn't specify, but he had enough self-awareness to know he had done wrong and that this book was helping him to face that. Mm -hmm. And I hope that more men read this book, mm -hmm. uh, and women too, but mostly it's men that need to read it. Women know what's up, and <laughs> I feel like we're good. It, it, <laughs> honestly, I do. Uh, I think it's time for men to do some homework and some soul searching. And a lot of men will say, and they often say this to me, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I would never hurt a woman and I've never done anything like this. And I think, I'm sure you haven't, but if your partner has ever said no and you've cajoled and wheedled her into having sex by persistence, you're part of the problem. And if your friends have bragged about their sexual exploits and diminished and degraded women. And you said nothing. And exactly, and you were silent, you are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And then they say, but you know, then you're trying to you know, emasculate me. I'm like, no, be a dude. Smell and whatever. <laughs> Sit with your legs spread open because of whatever. And you know, it's fine. No one's telling you to not be a man, but we are telling you to not be an asshole.
So on that note, do you think, we, we were talking about who should read this book. You said men and women should read this book. Yes, but mostly men. Yes, but uh, it's, it is difficult. It's a tough read. I mean, I, I couldn't read it all. I mean, not like I was just like sit, sitting down with a big cup of tea going, okay. Yeah, it's but, not cozy. <laughs> let's read it. it was, uh, I had to put it down. Mm -hmm. And people, some of the essays, they hang with you. I mean, they're, it's, it's difficult, um, but it's worth it. And it's, uh, you knew this. Um, can you talk about, did that happen with you in, in curating these, these pieces? Um, how did it affect you? Well, I mean, it's never pleasant to read this many dark and painful stories of the suffering of others. So reading the submissions was interesting and eye-opening and heartbreaking. And there were definitely days when I was like, I can't go into that submission right. queue today because I'm having enough of a bad uh -huh. day. Let's not make things even worse. Um, it was difficult, but it was not so difficult that I couldn't do it. It was just difficult, and it's supposed to be difficult. Yeah. These are difficult things. I think the day that we start to look at these kinds of stories and, and feel nothing, we have a real problem, because it means we've become immune to tragedy and suffering. Right. Uh, and I don't think that is, I think that's terrible. I think that's just a very dangerous precedent to set. So. I know that this is a difficult anthology to read, and I don't know that anyone's going to curl up with it for a fun weekend of reading. <laughs> it's not uh, a beach book. It's no. not a beach reading. Um, but I do think that you can go back and forth and skip around, and some people have been reading it front to back, and I, I think that's also admirable. So it just, I think it really depends on the reader and the, the space that they're in. And there's comfort, too, and it's this collective, you know, everyone feels some measure of what happened in these essays. And I'm assuming, I don't, I hate to assume, but I think I can, that everyone in this room has had some kind of something that, you know, you read this and you go, oh boy, I believe every single one of these people. I understand what was going on here. I, you know, it, it's a real, um, there's a strange kind of comfort in it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, companionship, for lack of a better yeah. word. A lot of the sense that I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who has dealt with this. I'm not the only one who finds this painful or frustrating or inexplicable. And a lot of the response I've had since the book came out is that sense of feeling some solidarity mm -hmm. and feeling less alone, which is wonderful to hear and also heartbreaking to hear because there's a reason why mm -hmm. people are connecting and the reason oftentimes is personal experience, and you don't want that for anybody. Um, but I'm also glad that the book can be there uh, to provide solace and to motivate people to want to create change and to make a difference, hopefully. So there's hope in it. I mean, there's... Absolutely. Are, so are th do you feel like things are changing, and is, do you feel hopeful? I don't feel hopeful. Um, no, I'm not going to lie to you. But I do think things have the potential to change. I think we're in as good a position as we've ever been to try and create change, as long as we sustain the energy that has been generated thus far by Me Too and Time's Up. Uh, you know, you already hear people talking about fatigue and backlash and worrying this over and, oh, it's gone too far. Um, no, rape is going too far. Um, talking about it and talking about the repercussions and naming the criminals who commit these crimes, that's not going too far. And so we just have to sustain this moment. And the justice system needs to respond appropriately and really come up with an ethical and sustainable way of dealing with these crimes. Well, I looked at Bill Cosby and I almost fell off my chair. I mean, I couldn't believe that he was convicted. It was the greatest yeah, that there. was interesting. I'm glad he was convicted. He deserves to be convicted. I, I'm still shocked it happened, but I also think that at some point you look at the evidence and you look at the sheer number of victims and you mm -hmm. just can't deny it. I think the sheer number of victims and the longevity of his predation 
was such that that jury had no choice. Right. I remember the, the New York Magazine cover of all the... Yeah, that was incredibly haunting to see was all it? of those women and then the empty chair. Yeah. For all of the women who have not come forward. And for every woman that's come forward, you have to imagine there are three who did not. And so, you know, we're looking at hundreds of women. One guy. Yes. And, and because it's, it's, a, it's a relatively small amount of the population that's committing these crimes, but they commit them with enthusiasm. And uh, oftentimes they are serial predators. Yeah, because they, there's the entitlement. They figured Absolutely. out how to do it. They can get away and with it. And they get it. better at it. They get better at it. Yeah. Um, what is different about sexual assault from other violent crimes? Um, and why are, why are we so uncomfortable with it? I think we're uncomfortable with it because people treat women as second-class citizens, and so anything that happens to women is not as bad as something that happens to men. So we in, just intrinsically diminish sexual violence against women. Uh, I also think so many people have the blurred lines mentality that it's not really rape. It's just it's regret. And, you know, but mostly it's just about women and misogyny. Yeah. And our victims, victims are not believed. Correct. Obviously. But because, you know, why would, why would he do that? You're a woman. And um, people just don't want to believe women. And I also, the better part of me thinks people don't want to believe that human beings are capable of such violence, but they are. Um, is it, I wonder if it's just too personal for people to wrap their heads around too, the things no. that you have to. I mean, that could be it, but I think it's just mostly misogyny. People hate women and they hate women's experiences. And so they just don't want to believe women. And it's hard to face that, but I think that's 85% of the issue, it's, which is very sad. I hope that that's changing. I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, because you look at the kind of women who are speaking out and you look at... Um, well, that's actually the problem. The kind of women that are speaking out are generally wealthy and white. And so people are going to believe them because they're like, yes, of course Uma Thurman has dealt with this. And of course Aja Argento has dealt with this. Um, but we're not seeing the stories of women who can't afford to come forward and who can't afford to jeopardize whatever professional standing they right. have. And who don't have a voice. Correct. And that is not to diminish the stories of the women that have come forward, because what's been interesting is that so many of the actors that have disappeared that I really loved, now we know what happened to them. Harvey Weinstein happened to them. So um, that's just painful. Annabella Sciorra, um, Mira Sorvino, um, like, they are incredibly talented, uh, and it's a, sh it's a shame that they had to deal with this. But in addition to being concerned about that, I'm concerned about the working class women and the women of color that don't get to come forward as much. Lupita Nyong'o shared her own experiences with Harvey Weinstein, and it's never discussed, ever. And She's not mentioned with the other victims? No, not at all. Right, and right. Um, race absolutely has a part to do with that. And so, yeah, it's good to be hopeful about this, what's going on, but I it think it's hope for white women and for wealthy white women. Working class women and women of color and transgender women are absolutely not being heard in this moment as much as they need to be heard. And they are also facing higher levels of predation and they are facing more severe consequences if and when they right. choose to come forward. So that's These aren't why, just roles, these are no. jobs, these are... These are lives. These are lives, yeah. And that's why it's hard to feel hopeful, because Me Too has come, but not for all of us. So what would you like to see, what would you like to see happen? Yeah, absolutely. What would you like to see change, happen? And I'm not going to say, you know, part of me feels like, oh, well, when white women open the door for, you know what I mean? Like they're... Well, because they don't. We, exactly. <laughs> Um, it's true. But 
well, why do we have to wait for them to open the door? You know yeah. what I'm saying? I mean, well, the thing is, they don't open the door. They go through the door and shut it after them. And so that's that's why it's again, it's hard to be hopeful. Um, what I, what I would like to see happen is to just kick the door down, and then more importantly, the media take as much interest in the stories of non-famous women as they are taking in the interest of women. And let's focus on the, pur the prurient details. So many of these articles just like want all the details, um, the salacious details. They want to make it this, and, and it just contributes to this idea that rape isn't that bad. Like, oh, tell us more. Um, I, I, the details don't matter. What matters is that a woman was violated. and. What matters is that she has been profoundly affected for many years, and I wish there was more focus on that instead of the what and the when and the why. Beyond, of course, journalistic standards. I'm fine with journalis journalistic standards and vetting, and I, I know that it has to happen, even though it's frustrating that women's stories require this much due process and yet, when it comes to justice, none of that due process is anywhere to be found. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just the media, I think, has to play a big role. And again, the justice system has to figure out what to do. Fewer than 10% of rapists are prosecuted and go to jail, which is an appalling statistic, and that has to change. But we also have to look at what we're doing to people when we send them to prison. Uh, because in general, they just go and they learn how to become better rapists. Um, there's no rehabilitation. And though I tend to reserve my empathy for the victims, I do still believe that we need a justice system that is focused more on rehabilitation mm -hmm. than just incarceration. Yeah, I agree. And recovery, you know. Um, I wanted to ask on time if we're okay. They haven't waved us away, so I guess we're okay. Um, We've been talking for 37 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's, an, that's something that now you have my head stirring. When the Time's Up, the Time's Up um, organization is raising all this money for the defense funds, for rape victims, mm -hmm. so they can report these rapes, Yes, so they're raising money for div um, not just rape victims, but assault, sexual harassment in the workplace. So they're providing resources for women who traditionally do not have the resources. Okay, uh, so it's that's an, one good yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a very good thing. I'm very encouraged by Time's Up. I think time will tell how effective it is, but a lot of money has been raised, and some very competent people are behind it, which is always important. Who are you most impressed with, or who do you wish would get more involved in this? What do you I'm wanna, most impressed with Tarana Burke, who created me too. Yes. Yes. I think that she deserves more attention than she's getting. People seem to just obligatorily re reference her when they get called out, but she is the one who started me too. And uh, people like, I, I do like her, but Rose McGowan is taking up quite a lot of the air in the room. And I, 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 that, I just think that's fine, but let's also look at what Tarana Burke is doing. And um, there are other women who are doing things, and I'm terrible at just coming up with names off it's the top okay. of my head. But she was at the Oscars, though, wasn't she on the yes, stage? Yes, yeah. she was yeah. at the Oscars. But, um, yeah, that's, which is nice, okay. but um, she's doing far more important work than going to the Oscars. She is actively touring the country and talking about these issues, and she's doing a lot of important work behind the scenes in terms of bringing visibility to women of color who have dealt with sexual violence. And uh, I wish people would talk about that as much as they would talk about um, uh, the more celebrity-ish aspects, because she's actually doing the work. Yeah. Yes. And she's, yeah. Not just wearing t-shirts. Um, I wanted to, I, I just, I want to make time for questions. So um, I think we're pretty ready to, you ready? You up for some? I am up for some questions. Okay. 
yes. So I'm actually going to wander around and, and help out with this. Okay? All right. I was just wondering if you could give a list of books that you would recommend reading besides your own, because I love all the ones that I've read of yours so far, and would love to hear what else you like to read. I read everything. Um, I would recommend Sing Unburied Sing by Jessamine yes, Ward, I loved it. which I thought was beautiful. I actually just finished a book called Bad Blood by John Carreyrou, which is about the Theranos scam. And it's really good and really interesting and fascinating to see how this girl dropped out of Stanford after two years with no real scientific background and got $900 million in funding from Henry Kissinger, <laughs> George Schultz, Rupert it. Murdoch, a bunch of like fancy hedge funds and did it be, like on a lie. Uh, on a product that does not exist and that the, the version that did exist doesn't work. It's really good. Um, I always recommend N.W. by Zadie Smith because it's my favorite novel other than uh, The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, which is my long, t it's just like my also favorite. Um, so yeah, those are some things that I recommend. But not To Kill a Mockingbird. No. <laughs> she just wrote a review a of a book about the, um, To Kill a Mockingbird, and it's, she was not impressed. No, I wasn't, because, no. <laughs> it's the cover review of the New York Times book review this yeah. Sunday, so you can check it out. Hi, Roxanne. My name is Mandy, and Hi. I was curious, did you ever get in touch with the man who raped you um, in the woods? No, absolutely not. Hi, Roxanne. Um, over here. <laughs> um, so you have a very big presence on social media, and I'm wondering um, how that impacts your your energy, your empathy, your writing, because. Um, you're, you're really willing to be out there and be vulnerable and as, like if you say in your Twitter profile, I clap back. So if someone comes after you, you're, out, you're back out there. And, and, and does that take a toll? And do you feel like that's part of your um, being a literary citizen or a spokesperson? No, I don't. Um, I'm just on Twitter for fun. <laughs> Honestly, people overestimate how much time Twitter takes for me. Um, I used to live in the middle of nowhere, actually still sort of do, and um, so I went on Twitter in 2007, and it was just a way to talk to other writers and meet other writers while living in a town of 4,000 in northern Michigan. Oh. Fuck. <laughs> um, so uh, that's how it started, and it just snowballed. Uh, and now, of course, now that I'm more visible and I have a bigger platform, for lack of a better word, I, I get all sorts of bullshit and harassment because whenever a black woman dares to have an opinion, there are about a million white men who are ready to tell her that she should die. Um, so does it take a toll? The harassment absolutely takes a toll. It absolutely does, and it's soul-destroying because it's not just on social media. These people send me uh, mail at my job because I teach at a state university, so my address at work is publicly available. Uh, they send me email at my job. They email my boss. Um, they send death threats. They email me. They Instagram message me. They Facebook message me. They Tumblr message me. There's no escaping it. And so you can filter it out, certainly, but it's still, lots of stuff still gets through the filters. And so it's just soul destroying. But I think that's humanity. And here you are, you're still here. Well, kick it yes. I mean, you know, let them, you know, talk to Lindy. She, she uh, went after one of her trolls and it yes, was the greatest did. thing in the world. It was, yeah. it was epic. So anyway, are you a drinking person? Do you drink? I drink, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, yes. Hi, um, so as someone who's visibly Muslim and black, I think at this point in my life, I'm only 21, 
but um, my question is for you specifically. Um, I think it's really hard at times to maybe find hope, uh, specifically a black woman and an American, um, and at times where you know your identity is always questioned and you always have to um, constantly fight for your existence. I guess my question is, do you have hope for the future? I mean, hope is such a hard question to wrap around, like to grasp and wrestle with, specifically as you're constantly being marginalized in this world, and it's not fair to ask a black person, to say the least. Um, but but I really think it's um, it's quite uh, <laughs> it's it's very early for me to be a skeptic at 21. I have a huge um, line of um, or life ahead of me of disappointment. So my question is, uh, what can, like what should I? How do I? How do I uh, have hope? I guess even yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I ask myself that question every day. It's really hard right now. It's really hard. Like. I knew that when when Trump was elected, I was like, wow, this is going to be really bad. And that was such an... of how bad it has been. Like, that, I wish it was just bad, but it's horrific. And so it's really hard, but I also think that we have to continue to have hope or what are we doing? Why are we waking up each day? Why are we fighting each day? So I, I just think it's one of those things where you have to make the subversive choice to have joy and to, to, to have hope. Otherwise, they win. And that's, that's what they want. They want us to ask ourselves, how do we have hope? Because they want to break us down so that we stop protesting when they do some new insane thing. And uh, it's not working, but they're getting close because, I mean, it's just, it's getting kind of exhausting. And it's a privilege to say that. Oh, I'm tired of the news. Yeah, imagine if you were watching your child be pulled away from you and put into an internment camp. Uh, that's, I'm sure, infinitely more exhausting. And so I think we just have to, I think hope is a form of resistance at this point. And so I see it as a responsibility. But there are days when I struggle. Also, you're 21. Like, and you're adorable. So just, just remember, like, you have so much time left to do a really interesting and important work and to have adventures. So focus on that, too. Hi there. Um, I wanted to ask how you navigate holding survivors accountable. Um, as a rape survivor myself, I understand the importance of giving space for survivors to process their trauma, be heard, feel supported. At the same time, especially now with Me Too, we have folks coming out on social media and, you know, kind of outlaying the things that have happened to them, sometimes in problematic ways, especially for white, middle class, upper, upper class women. And I'm, I'm just interested to hear how you try and acknowledge some of the problematic things that folks say while also respecting the fact that, you know, they had to endure something really traumatic and all of the complexities of that. When you say problematic, what do you mean? Like, what, what is a problematic thing a rape survivor would say? Um, so survivors both of sexual or any type of sexual violence, like one common one that I saw was uh, folks saying hashtag me too, but I was only sexually harassed. Oh, yeah, I think you, yeah. have, to, you have to forgive them. Like, yeah. there's nothing, I mean, that's problematic, but that's misogyny at work. Um, you have to have empathy for a woman who says that. It's not their fault because they're told, we're told every single day to walk it off to suck it up. So when a woman says, I was only sexually harassed, she is a victim of this culture that tells her, you were just sexually harassed, what are you crying about? And so they're not actually the problem um, at all. They are just in a system. You know, we do have to hold each other accountable. You know, being sexually assaulted isn't a free pass to say whatever bullshit you want to say and be horrible. Like, it, it, it's not a protected class. So if you are a sexual assault survivor, you can also be an asshole. And you can call someone out for being an asshole. Like, they're not, like, shielded 
by their past. And so when someone does something that's actually problematic, call them out. But when someone says something like, I was just harassed, or I was just date raped, or whatever, just feel some tenderness to them and say, why are you diminishing your own pain? And to what end? That's what I try to do. Because when you ask that question, a lot of times they'll say, yeah, actually, that's a good question. Why am I doing that? Hence the title of your book. Not, not that bad. Not, not, not that Check bad. Check it out. Yeah. <laughs> Buy the book. It's in the back. Side note, I did check it out. It's an amazing book. Everyone should read it. Um, OK, so I love your book. And I'm very curious, um, just as a reader and also as somebody who researches sexual assault disclosure, social reactions to sexual assault disclosure, and works with a lot of sexual assault survivors, what do you think is the role of sexual assault narratives and coming forward and laying this all bear for the public to see um, by survivors. What is the role of that work um, in ending sexual violence, rape culture, changing this terrible thing we're all living in? I don't know because you know a lot of time, a lot of people recently, in the past year and a half, have said men, I should say, have said, "I had no idea it was this bad," and I actually chewed this guy out on Twitter. I really fucking laid into him, like, what the fuck? Where have you been? He was a reporter for the New York Times, so like, you don't even read your own paper? What is your problem? Um, you know, the reality is that women have been sharing their narratives of sexual violence for as long as sexual violence has existed. And those narratives have done nothing to move the needle. And so I don't know what the role is. I do think that all too often women are expected to cannibalize themselves. And they're expected to testify and share their pain. And they're validated for doing that sharing. And so I think it's a very personal choice. I think for a lot of women, there is closure and catharsis in coming forward and saying, this happened to me. Because historically, there has been so much silence around sexual violence. At the same time, I hate that that seems to be the price of admission for a woman to be understood and for her suffering to be validated. Like, you have to tell all of the details. I remember when Bad Feminist came out, um, a woman reviewed the book, a woman reviewed the book, and she said that when I didn't detail my rape, in my essay, What We Hunger For, she got so angry, she threw the book across the room. And I was just like, bitch, what? <laughs> like, th th there was this expectation that my, I wasn't doing my job as a writer because I didn't want to share the gory details of being gang raped at 12 years old by a bunch of men in a fucking hunting cabin. Like, it's not a great story. And I think that it's my right to keep those details to myself because my parents are alive and my partner is alive. And are these things that you want in their head? I don't want them in my head. Um, and so this expectation, even in intellectual circles, exists when people should know better. And so I, anytime a woman doesn't want to share her story and resists that sort of cultural demand that she bear herself, I applaud it. I think it's a personal choice, and we should encourage women to make whatever choice they feel is best. Agreed. Thank you. You're welcome. There were a bunch of questions on the right side. Oh, oh, I see you. I, I apologize. I did not see you, my queen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Victoria. I just kind of wanted to ask a question. Um, I'm a current PhD student academic, um, doing research around race, gender, sexuality in the media. Um, I just kind of want to know how do you navigate the academic space now that you're also a bestseller and you're really writing about some really, really deep stuff and then you're teaching at a, a predominantly white institution and I know uh, career as well as thinking about students. So I kind of wonder how does your new fame, I guess, um, contribute to how you have to kind of perform your identity within the classroom or within uh, the academic space? That's an excellent question. I have tenure. So... <laughs> I have been very lucky in terms of my academic career in that I got a tenure track job immediately. And I then went to another tenure track job and I got tenure in five years. So, um, 
It's been difficult. I've always been at predominantly white institutions. I probably always will be if I stay in the academy. And so the protections of academic freedom have allowed me to say whatever I want to say throughout my career. I, I've just not cared. And I think that's because I always knew I can get another job, um, whether it's at Barnes and Noble or whatever, and I can move home with my parents. And so when you have that kind of safety net, you have no fucks to give. Um, it's been challenging at times to, because the academy is actually very racist and very condescending and so I've had to stand up for myself and resist uh, the bullshit that my white colleagues oftentimes try to put on me. Like I remember when I got my first job at EIU, um, Eastern Illinois University, uh, one of these, oh he was a good old boy and he was like 80 years old and he came up to me at, at a meeting, a committee meeting because I was on every committee because I checked three boxes, I was a woman, I'm black, and I'm queer. Um, he said, they must have given you a hell of a package to come here. I know they do that for you guys. And I was just like, yes, you're right. They did give me a hell of a package, and I earned every penny of it. Um, and so having to like do that, but also getting stopped in the parking lot and being asked to show my ID, my student ID, because the security guard making minimum wage can't wrap his mind around the fact that I might work there, um, has the nerve to ask me for my ID. It's, it's offensive, like that you have to articulate your position at every level, whether it's the president of the university or the hourly wage security guard. And there's nothing wrong with hourly wage work at all. It's that you have no standing as a black woman in the academy, and they would never talk to a white faculty member the way they would talk to a black faculty member. So it becomes exhausting. And how are you supposed to produce research in an environment where you have to fight for your standing with your colleagues, with staff members, and then sometimes with your own students. Because at that same university, I had a student taught to use the word colored. And he was not being malicious. He genuinely did not know that you don't call black people colored. And so you have to do that level of education in addition to what you're being paid to teach. It's exhausting. Uh, at Purdue, it's been better because um, I had you know, I, was a, I went into Purdue as an associate professor without tenure and then got tenure, but there was just less service work expected of me. It was more conservative institutionally, um, and the higher my profile has risen, the happier Purdue has been with me. Because it's a conservative institution, but it's also a capitalist institution. <laughs> And every time I'm published, in general, it says Roxane Gay is an associate professor at Purdue University, so they get a lot of free advertising in the New York Times from my existence. So they've been really supportive, and I teach, <laughs> I teach one class a year, and so it's not a bad gig. You'll have to excuse my stage for it a little bit here. I wanted to ask you about the place of anger. Um, I find oftentimes, let's say, and it's usually righteous, right? When you're responding in anger to a situation of injustice or you know, something terrible that happens to you, people will often say, man, if you only said that a little more politely, I'd be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm ashamed to admit, I used to be one of those people that would say that. Um, as time has gone on, I've realized that their anger is righteous, and that's really dismissive and terrible. Um, in the more general world, what's the place of being so furious about what's happening when you feel, when it's like the way it is? I don't yeah. know. I think anger is an entirely appropriate response to racism, misogyny, xenophobia, and every other thing that we're seeing. And when people say, I would listen to you if you weren't so angry, what they're really trying to do is dictate the terms of discourse to make themselves as comfortable as possible. And we see this, quite frankly, a lot on the left, that if we just play by the rules and we're gentlemanly enough, we're gonna be okay. It's like duels back in the day where there were all these rules, like let's move, let's count to 10 and then shake hands before we murder each other. 
Like, no, you can just shoot me now. It's fine. Yes, it, I mean, a feckless cunt is a feckless cunt. And uh, one needs, the truth hurts sometimes. So if that hurts your feelings, then stop being a feckless cunt. Um, you know, I just think that anger is appropriate. And increasingly when people try to dictate the rules of discourse to me, I just stop engaging with them. And we have to stop right now with this nonsense or we are going to lose the 2020 election. It is imperative that we stop thinking that we have to play by the rules and we have to stop parroting Michelle Obama's they go low, we go high, because we are not Michelle Obama. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry for everyone I didn't get to. You've been waiting for a while. I'll, I'll take, a f I can take more than one. Okay, I'm just one person with one mic over here. Okay. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I like that you just referenced Samantha B. though I struggle with the fact that over and over, although we're seeing more women coming forward uh, with platforms to speak, it's still white women. Yeah. That wasn't even my comment, so sidebar. <laughs> um, I love the title of your book. I think it really speaks to the nuances of rape culture and the way that to say something is not that bad is to minimize it, but even in the writing, the writers themselves sort of turn that on themselves, you know, and question their own actions that led them to this. Um, Ultimately, what I worry about is that the Me Too movement is going to hit a point of fatigue. And I already worry that, you know, here in this space, we all care, we're all motivated. But how do we capture the attention of the people that have stopped caring and have become numb to it? Mm -hmm. And the way that with so many people coming forward, it, it almost creates a normalcy to these experiences that we don't want happening. So how do we address that? Well, I think it's really important to stop worrying about that. I understand where the worry comes from, but think about what energy you're spending worrying like that and not doing the actual work that is demanded of this moment. A lot of people are spending so much time and so much energy worrying about fatigue and backlash. Anyone who's fatigued is not someone that we were really ever going to reach anyway, quite frankly. Um, and the older I get, the more I'm just like, fuck them. Like, that's just not my target audience. And, uh, and, um, but there are people who can still be reached and you'll know them when you see them, but it's not the person who's like, I'm just tired of hearing about all these women and their suffering. Like that's someone who has obviously not suffered enough um, because they have the bandwidth to say some nonsense like that. Um, it, and it's, it, it's a, yeah, I, I know that's not a great answer, but it's the true answer, which is your energy is best spent elsewhere instead of hand-wringing about something that some people are going to be fatigued. Some people were fatigued on day one. Some people were fatigued on day negative 10 before it ever happened um, because they don't want to face reality. They don't want to deal with what's happening. And that is such a luxury to be able to opt out. Mm, I would love it. When am I getting a TV show uh, to be on TV? Never. <laughs> Never. I get asked that all the time, and I think it's a great platform, but the world is incredibly cruel. Whenever I go on TV, the amount of hate mail I get, and it's just like, you're fat, you're ugly, you're fat, you're ugly, like, that's it. Um, which I already know, so I don't, like, thanks. But why? And so it's just, for my sanity, I can't be on TV regularly because I just can't. It's too much. What'd okay. you say? I am working on a podcast. Yeah. You know, the re I'm really busy. I have a lot of stuff going on. So um, I'm taking next year off from my day job. And so... I don't think anything is going to happen in the podcast space until 2019, but me and my team <laughs> <laughs> are working on coming up with something. Uh, and um, I'm actually thinking of doing a podcast, and she knows this, with Tressie McMillan Cottom, because uh, we uh, are friends, and I like the way she thinks, and she's far more leftist than I am, which I need. She pulls me left. 
and I think that we have some interesting things to say. So hopefully in 2019, uh, we will be, um, you know, going in that space. I, oh, you, I, I told them I would, going? I said I would take a few more. Okay, they were yay, so many I didn't, I'm going. I can, you can sit down. Stand up yeah, and I hear you. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Where are you? Uh, Strange Gods, the last story in Difficult Women. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a difficult story. It is. Um, all of the stories in Difficult Women, you know, speak to me in one way or another because I wrote them. But <laughs> little detail. Um, but I think the story that most, and they're actually all fiction, uh, but the story that was the most emotionally wrought for me and that affected me the most in the writing and when I go back and read it is Strange Gods. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so she has a 16-year-old daughter and there's a dearth of literature addressing, you know, how to be out in the world and how to be safe, but also to how to have relationships. And, you know, I think that's something that we just have to f get more writers addressing, but I don't know that there's the right thing to say. It's just hard to be 16. <laughs> it's really hard to be 16. And I think we just haven't figured out how, what, what do we say to a young girl right now so that she's aware of the realities of the world but she's not paranoid and that she's not living as if she's a victim in waiting? Because that's no way for a person to live regardless of their gender or sexuality or other identity markers that make them f marginalized in the world. And so while you're waiting for literature, just put a range of books in front of her from Oftentimes, you're not going to find it all in one book, but you're going to find pieces in different books. And so just use work that speaks to you that you think, okay, my child is going to get something from this. Hi. Yes. Hi. So um, as, a, as a black woman in um, corporate America, so I don't have, you know, the tender track job and I have to be very careful what I say and I'm... You're 18 in a firm that is um, one of the best places to work. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and the last project um, that I'm gonna engage in before I move on to something else is um, our equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative. And so I guess I would ask you, um, it's really exciting for me to make the place a better place and leave this for the people who are new, for the black women, the, the white women, all the women, and the minority men who are coming into the firm now, mm -hmm. um, after I've had some challenging times. And if you were to kind of put some nuggets into that training, into that program, so that people that walk out of the room after a two or three hour training, um, because I firmly believe that corporate America is where the culture of this country could change. Yeah. And unfortunately, I have a CEO who's very much on board with this initiative, a white male CEO. What would you do? What would you say? What would you include? Ooh, good question. You know, I, I don't know that it's something I would include in a three-hour training. I, instead, I would think about what do I do beyond the three-hour training? I think that the three-hour training exists is good and you're gonna figure out what to say. But the real issue in terms of diversity and inclusion in corporate America is not recruitment, it's retention. And so what can you do in that program to focus on retention long-term? And what kinds of things can you do to make a predominantly white institution, like a, a predominantly white corporate institution, f 
more amenable to people of color? What kinds of changes do you need to make? They've gotten pretty good about women, for example, breastfeeding stations and flexible work time and so on. But what kinds of things do people of color need? And so I think the best thing you can do is ask the people of color who are currently working there and women, what would you need to stay here and be satisfied and happy and fulfilled here? Um, and during a three hour orientation or sort of discussion, I think it's important to let people know the sky is the limit here, if that's true. But if the limit's the sky, they also need to know that so that they aren't soul crushingly throwing themselves against a system that's never going to bend. Does that make sense? All right, thank you. How many more, Roxanne? You I'll wrote? take two more. Okay, so yes. I have one here and then that one up there. Okay. Who's up there? She well, can hear you. I Go. can hear her. Go ahead. time for black intellectuals. You've got ta Coates, you've got yourself, you've got Ajoma Oluo, you know, in Toronto Burke, she's an activist, but you know, still, it's a really interesting time because I think about all of them in the same way. I think about what their lives were like, which are probably very similar to my own, right? And then they became famous and they crossed this threshold. And then what happens is they end up in an audience full of white people mm -hmm. who love them, right? And I just wonder how, how, you, how do you reconcile that? Because I know that the pain of living as a black woman before you were Roxane Gay is probably still with you. Um, you know, it's not something I struggle with reconciling because I'm from Nebraska. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, my whole life I've lived in predominantly white environments, and the way I satisfied, the way I survived it was because I'm Haitian American, and my parents took us to Haiti every summer and reminded us that we came from free people, and so with that kind of background, I was able to. I, I, my, my experience as a black woman was not grounded in suffering. It was grounded in annoyance. Um, but I had a country and a people to go back to to remind me that I come from free people. And that instilled in me and continues to instill in me the confidence that I have to take chances and to hold my head high no matter where I am. Now, I do my audience my readership, for whatever reason, is predominantly white. And I don't struggle with that. What I struggle with is that publishing has yet to figure out how to appropriately and effectively market to communities of color. And so um, I ask myself, what can I do? So for example, for my next two nonfiction books, I told HarperCollins they need to hire a black publicist. And um, I also try to do, and I don't talk about it because it's not that interesting, but I try to do, when I go to most major cities, I try to do community level work where I go to a community of color and meet with writers groups in those communities. Um, the truth is that my price point, most communities of color cannot afford me. Um, and that, so I do those things for free. Um, and another challenge is that oftentimes these events are held in predominantly white areas, even in major cities, and the bookstores don't know how to reach out to communities of color. So I, when I can, I try to encourage them, like, are you going to where black people live and putting up some flyers about my event? Like, when I do an event in St. Louis and five black people show up, I, I do ask them, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, what happened? So I try to do what I can. I hope to continue, I hope to do more, um, but I also recognize that the responsibility is not solely mine. And so for me, it forces me to critique the institutions that host event li events like this because people always act like it's such a mystery. How do we get more black people here? Uh, go to where we live and invite us explicitly <laughs> because sometimes people need to know they're welcome. And just like existing is not a welcome mat for marginalized communities. That's a very good question. Thank you. 
Hi. So, as a um, victim, I prefer to call it survivor, of four sexual assaults throughout my life, I try to go through day by day trying to make sure that I don't make anybody worry and I try to stay quiet and at this point I think, well, I think it's bullshit, <laughs> honestly. Um, I feel like it's not fair and I just wonder how do you manage to get through feeling like, I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. But how do you get through day by day living through what happened to you? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, therapy, a lot of therapy, a, a lot. And for me, it's been 30 years. So the truth is that I don't, I, I, what I wrote in Hunger is true. I'm as healed as I'm ever going to be. And I'm fine with that. But therapy which is a luxury that everyone should be afforded is the main thing that has helped me off and on and i'm actually back in therapy now for the first time in 10 years because i can afford therapy for the first time in 10 years um well actually for the first time in 20 years but um that's what has helped getting support for coping mechanisms for dealing with the trauma for um dealing with the flashbacks which still happen for dealing with the self-loathing and for dealing with uh food which has been the biggest issue for me because that was my coping mechanism in the aftermath of my assault um i also try to just remind myself every single day of how far i've come i look at where i was and I look where I am, and I just think, despite their best efforts, you survived. And not only that, you have thrived. And so I try to remind myself of that when I'm feeling low and when I'm feeling like I'm every worst thing that people have said about me and I'm as bad as what happened to me. I try to remind myself that every day that I wake up and open my eyes and I'm still breathing is an act of triumph, because it is. Um, and, you know, I also try to remind myself that I'm allowed to take up space and that I don't have to conform how I move through the world to make other people feel comfortable. So that includes using the kinds of language that I want to use and talking about my assault as often as I want to talk about it instead of, like, because there are some people in my life who have said, are you done talking about rape yet? No, actually, I'm just getting started. <laughs> and so I try to take those moments for myself and I encourage you to take those moments for yourself where you can and to take up space where you can and to recognize that you have survived a level of trauma that would break someone, but it has not broken you. And uh, you have to say that to yourself over and over again. Um, because it's true. Thank you so much, Seattle. Thank you.